Twice he has won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. He has topped the New York Times bestseller list for months on end, and he has used his unique writing talents to bring history to life. Hello, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up on Interviews, our conversation with the author of the best-selling books, Truman, John Adams, and 1776, David McCullough. opinion, what makes a history book worth reading? If it conveys the atmosphere, the feeling, the reality of that other time in an honest way and in a way that's compelling enough to make one feel as well as know uh, what happened. I don't think you can really know something until you feel it. Right. And so when a writer can bring the reader into the subject the way uh, literature can bring one into a subject, then history lives. It, don't not, it doesn't just live for the reader, but it lives in the sense that it will be read for a long time to come. It isn't just something that will be of interest or appeal of the moment but will stand the test of time. How do you keep it separate from becoming a textbook? How do you make it something that's going to be popular to read? Well, uh, H. Ryder Haggard was a great um, uh, popular writer of, the, of another era, late 19th century, famous, most famous for the novel King Solomon's Mines, which was made into a famous movie later on. And he once said, the first duty of a story is to keep him who reads it awake. (laughs) Uh, There are some very, very good textbooks. uh, Textbooks about the history of the United States of America. But too many of them are deadly beyond description. It's as if they were designed to kill any interest a young person might have in in history. I think that all history, uh, as we offer it as we uh, encourage it to our young people, ought to be well enough written that we would want to read it just as they would want to read it. There's been wonderful history written for hundreds and hundreds of years, well, all the way back to the Thucydides, uh, and that kind of history lives if, if it's written in a way that people want to read it mm-hmm. and, be, and, and with a sense of of understanding of cause and effect, yes, but also the human condition, human nature. One of the uh, sort of guiding examples that's been a favorite of mine for many years is uh, an admonition or an example uh, provided by Ian Forster in his wonderful book about the art of fiction. He said, if I tell you that the king died and then the queen died, that's a sequence of events. If I tell you that the king died and the queen died of grief, that's a story. You can look up almost anything in history in an Encyclopedia Britannica or on the web or internet, or you can look it up in a textbook, and you may get the information. But information isn't necessarily the truth. Information doesn't uh, touch the imagination, touch the heart, touch the the intellect uh, the way the great writers of history have been able to do. And that's what I aspire to do. When you write It's a, not easy. It's well, not easy at all. When you write a all. history book, do you approach it any differently than writing a biography? Or do you use the same tools, the same approach? No, they're quite different. Biography is a very different form. It's a wonderful form. But you have to stay rather close to your subject. You can't stray off much. You can't go off on tangents. Now, the advantage of biography is that the subject's life is the narrative spine of the book, birth to death, so forth. Uh, With history, you can shift the focus. You can move here, move there. It's a freer form, in my view. I started out writing history with no particular intention of doing biography. I sort of wandered into biography, 
once I began doing it, I loved it. And I've spent 20 years writing biography. But with 1776, it's a return to history where I can give a lot of attention to characters who are minor characters, who are not even characters who normally figure in history books, textbooks, formal histories. They're not important enough, but to my point of view, they're very important because in the case of four or five of them in what I've written, they are telling what happened in their words in a way that's not to be found anywhere else. You can't invent dialogue when you're writing history or biography. You can't invent uh, the, the, the details of, of anything. You have to draw on, on evidence, on the surviving record. But you can draw upon letters and diaries, which are expressions of individual opinion, individual uh, emotion, individual uh, judgment, uh, observation, all of that. And some of it, of course, is very colorful in, in the vernacular of the language. And that, too, reflects character and is, a, as, and is a reflection on the spirit of the time. People in the 18th century talked quite differently. Their vocabulary was differently. Their uh, emphasis on, on certain aspects of life was different because life was very different. Right. And you find, it, you find it with life in it uh, in what they wrote in private or in correspondence or diaries. The great thing about the supposedly dead past is every time you scrape the surface, you find life. And the job, of, the job of a writer is to get below the surface, no matter what you're writing, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, history, biography, get below the surface. Is there a pressure, concern, thought that runs through your head when you're writing a history, when you're writing 1776, and you know you're a very well thought, a very noted author, in a lot of ways, what you write is going to be somewhat definitive on this topic. Is there a pressure on you? What happens when you're pulling things together? If you might not get it right, do you worry about that? Well, no, I don't worry about it. I'm very, I'm very, I feel very responsible for that. And that's a, a professional uh, code. That's a, a, that's a requirement. Uh, what I would hope, what I think about is if those people could take a look at what I've written, those people who were there could be over my shoulder looking on. Would they say, you got it. That's the way it was. That, to me, would be five-star review. That would be the best I could do. That concerns me far more than will some reviewer in the this or that publication or some professor at this or that university has to say. But do you know I, I when you be, get it? I want to tell what happened and why and about them, and you can't know why things happen entirely unless you know about them, right. in their terms. But even knowing about them, you, I'm not saying you're 100% sure of everything. I think there's some place... Oh, you're never 100% sure. So then when Nobody, you put that on paper... You're like, it's like calling a close play at home plate. Yeah. But you have to call it if that's your job. If you're, if you're not entirely sure or if you're hypothesizing then you've got, to, you've got to show that. You have to, you have to reveal that. You can have all the facts right and, and miss the point. Right. Just as you can have some facts wrong or some, and be dead on. Um, it takes a lot of absorbing so that the, 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 that other time and those other people become very familiar to you. And you can know those people in some ways better than you can know people in your real life because you're studying them every day and you're reading their letters, you're reading their diaries. You, you can't do that in real life. And of course now today none of, nobody writes letters, nobody keeps diaries, so it's going to be tough sledding for the biographers and historians of the future. Do you feel that you learned something new about John Adams writing this book, 1776? Yes, I learned something new about all of it and all of them every time I do anything. Even after everything you did yes. with John Adams? Yes, yes. Really? Yes, because Adams comes through to me even stronger uh, through this. How often he was right about what the army really needed. Washington, for example, was insisting as strongly as he could that they, ha they had to pay these people properly. They had to make it a regular army. They had to promise them a bonus. And when you read the, the, 
the innumerable letters that he wrote. He wrote almost a thousand letters in the course of the 18 months that I covered, a large number of which were written to Congress to try to explain how desperate his needs were and so forth. And he wanted to give, promise them a bonus of land. Mm -hmm. And Adams is ahead of him on that. And he sees that. And he's ahead of, of the others in Congress. And uh, he's quite, it seems to me, realistically um, simpatico with the needs of the army, even though he never saw any of the war. And that's one of the things that also made me want to write this book, is Jefferson, uh, Adams, uh, Franklin, the others who were participating in the, in the drama of Independence Hall in Philadelphia at the time of the Declaration of Independence, they, they never saw any of the war. They never saw people getting killed. They never saw these people in rags uh, marching uh, through uh, snow and sleet with uh, their feet wrapped in rags. They, they never saw that. Should we have won? When you read your book, and you read, and especially in the beginning, and you're describing what's going on and who's pulled together and how many people and all of that, it seems as though if that were where it ended, right in the beginning of your book, the outcome would be totally different. Why is it that we were able to pull this off? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the more you know about it, the more you can't help feeling it was a miracle. Yeah. It could have gone either way any number of times. Now, it would be easy to list all the advantages we had, all the mistakes that the other side made. But you could also list all the mistakes we made and all the advantages the other side had. And there's certain gross misconceptions about this struggle. One is that there was mad King George who lost the colonies. Well, George III was still in his 30s in 1776. He wasn't mentally unbalanced. That didn't afflict him until 20 years later. See, I find him one of the most interesting characters in the book. He's a very he interesting man. Comes alive very sympathetic man. Yeah. He's intelligent. He's a, he's a gifted uh, musician, a gifted artist. Also, it's sometimes said that his administration, his cabinet, uh, were bumblers and didn't know what they were doing, and they were sending orders to the United States that were unrealistic. That, that too, is not true. Nor, nor were the officers in command of the British Army in the United States, pinheaded aristocrats who should never have had command anyway, but only had the command because they were aristocrats. They, they were very good officers. Some of them were excellent officers. Some of them were mediocre officers. But they were, by and large, far better than what we had. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, if some of them had had command instead of William Howe, had the ultimate command, I think the outcome would have been different. It's also said that the Hessians were drunk at, uh, at uh, Trenton. They weren't drunk. Uh, they were caught by surprise, but they weren't, it wasn't because they had been celebrating Christmas the night before. Uh, it's also often portrayed that all the Americans who marched with George Washington were heroes. And the whole country was together uh, in spirit and in purpose to achieve freedom and revolution and independence. Not so. Uh, less than half the country were for it, and uh, perhaps an equal number were against it, and then there was the remaining people were just sort of in between, waiting to see who came out on top. Uh, and of the men who marched with Washington, hundreds of them deserted, uh, hundreds of them defected to the enemy, and thousands of them, when their enlistments ran out, simply went home uh, at, a, at a point when they were desperately needed. The heroes are those who, w with Washington, would not quit, mm -hmm. would not give up. And it got down to a point where there were th only 3,000 of them. 3,000 people, yeah. an army of, scant little army of 3,000 men, uh, many of whom were ill, all of whom were in rags, all of whom were starving, uh, no winter clothing, winter coming on, who would not quit. They would, they would go with him, Washington, through hell, and they did. And those are the people to whom we owe so much. Yeah. How, to switch gears just a little bit here, how do we keep this kind of education, this learning, alive in our schools today? I mean, the, the love, the joy you have in exploring this and learning and sharing this with people, are we losing that today? 
Yes, we're doing a very poor job of educating our children in history. Very poor. And it's, it's been apparent for a long time, more than 20 years. And there are all kinds of studies. I've had personally all kinds of experience uh, lecturing or as a visiting professor at universities uh, confronting this firsthand. Um, it's not the fault of the students. It's not their fault. I think we have to re greatly revise the way we teach our teachers. And we've got to uh, encourage all the people who are in responsible for teaching teachers to take a, take a new look. I don't think we should be graduating people with a degree in education. I think everyone who wants to teach should have to be, have a good old-fashioned liberal arts education with a major in history or biology or physics or English literature or whatever it might be. Because if you're assigned to teach a subject that you know nothing about, which happens over and over again every single day, it's not that it's difficult to teach something you don't know. It's also impossible to love something you don't know, just as it's impossible to love someone you don't know. And as you know from your own life, the teachers that really changed your life or that opened the window for you were those who loved the subject they were teaching and could convey that enthusiasm. So we have to revise the way we're teaching our teachers. And I think as parents and grandparents, we need to not just leave it entirely to the teachers. We need to talk about history within the family. Take our children, take our grandchildren to historic sites. Don't wait for the school trip to do that. Uh, to give them, give our children at any age, grade school, high school, college, give them books of history or biography that we've loved and say, look here, this is a terrific book. You'd like this. Uh, that, a book can change your life. I read, I was given uh, Bruce Catton's The Stillness at Appomattox about the Civil War when I graduated from college. And, uh, and I'd been an English major. And I read that book, and I absolutely loved it. And I then began reading more of Mr. Catton's work, then began to read people like Shelby Foote, then branched out reading Margaret Leach, Barbara Tuckman, uh, on and on, and for pleasure because I enjoyed them as much as any novels I'd ever read. I just thought they were superb. And I was learning so much. And then it began to dawn on me, maybe, maybe you could write, maybe I could write that kind of book. So the transforming power of a single book is, is beyond uh, our reckoning. And I know it from personal experience. So we should be doing that. And you, you can do it with a fourth grader, too. Uh, there's a little book called Ben and Me by Robert Lawson <laughs> about a mouse that lived in Ben Franklin's hat. His name was Amos. He was one of 26 children. <laughs> I and read he, this when I was a child. And he was born and raised behind the paneling in Old Christ Church in Philadelphia. And it, he, he, he was my first revisionist historian <laughs> because he starts off and says, Ben was a perfectly fine fellow and, and reasonably good company. But I have to tell you, most of his ideas were not original. Most of his ideas came from well, they came from me. Well, <laughs> the I, mouse who lived in yes, I read that book when I was probably six or something, seven years old. And I just I became a Ben Franklin fan right away. Now, can, that's, that's what we should be doing. And it gives us something to talk about with our grandchildren or children in addition to uh, talking about television or sports or whatever. I think history ought to be seen not just as good for you or necessary to make you a better citizen. It ought to be seen as a source of pleasure. Yeah. It's an extension of the experience of being alive, like music or art or literature or the theater. Have you written for a children's audience? No. Would you ever? But I have 17 grandchildren. Well, I talk to them a lot. Then write it down. Yeah. Wouldn't that be, what would you approach? How would you <clears throat> go at doing something like that? How would it be different than the way you approach it today? Well, I would feel, um, I would feel an equal responsibility to convey what happened accurately, fairly, not to exaggerate or to distort. But I would want to make it compelling enough that the reader, the young reader, is immediately involved. And it ought to be, uh, it ought to be a good adventure. Young people love adventures. They love, they love um, stories that are a little scary, too, as we all know. But it's not hard. Barbara Tuckman said... Um, there's no trick to, t to teaching history. Tell stories, right. because that's what it is. 
And that, that advice you just said for writing a child's book, is that the same rules you use when doing the adult books? No, I don't really feel I have any rules. I just have a way I want to do it. I, uh, I, I loved, as a young man, reading historical novels. The novels of Kenneth Roberts, for example, were marvelous and very popular when I was a boy. But I always used to think, how much of this is true and how much of it is made up? And I wanted to know what, what was the true part. And uh, when I began reading people like Mr. Catton and Margaret Leach and others, I, and I began to think that I could do that, I thought, why couldn't I write it at, in a way that was as compelling as, as some of the wonderful historical novels that I've enjoyed? But everything in it's true. Mm -hmm. Everything in it is accurate, or as accurate as it's possible to be. And that by being inside the subject, people ask me, are you writing a book? Are you working on a book? And I say, yes, that's right. But I really feel I'm working in a book. Try to get inside that other time. And it's so important to understand the age in which things happen and to, uh, to soak yourself in the, in the vernacular of the day, in the science, the medicine, the food, the music, the, the, um, uh, the sins and scandals and, and crime, the, the whole reality of that time. For example, anyone who studies the 18th century soon realizes that they were very strong people. Mm -hmm. Tough. You had to be. Life was hard as can be. By our standards, almost intolerably tough, uncomfortable, inconvenient. Uh, they would look upon us as softies, you know, we were so coddled and protected and, and uh, we, we whimper and uh, complain and cry over the least little thing by their standards. Right. Uh, in a day when disease was rampant, when uh, every job had its, uh, its physical dangers, when people were marked by inj work injuries, uh, by childhood disease, by childhood accidents that left them with a permanent limp or head cocked to one side, all of that. You can read it in the descriptions of what people look like, pock marks from smallpox, all of that. Um, they weren't figures in a costume pageant. They were, they were real human beings. Is that what draws you to that period? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a wonderfully exciting time because so much is happening. It's not just the Enlightenment and the 18th century. There's all kinds call all kinds of things physically going on. You know, Captain Cook is off on his expedition. Uh, Adam Smith wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations, a whole new intellectual idea. The combination of Adam Smith and the Declaration of Independence alone in one year. Now that's not my story in the part that I've read. I'm, I'm staying right with that army and, I, and with Washington and Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox and the British, and the Hessians, and the Loyalists, and the, <laughs> and the innocent bystanders. Right. And um, it, it, it's, it's, um, it, it pulls you right in. And of course, their language is so wonderful. You don't have any photographs. There are no illustrations done by artist correspondents the way, uh, say, Winslow Homer covered the Civil War. There's nothing like that. There are no film clips. There are no recording of voices. Uh, and nobody covered the war as a correspondent for a newspaper. Newspapers didn't do that. What you have, however, as limited as it may seem, in the diaries and the letters is so strong, is so rich and flavorful, so uh, lifelike, that it makes up for what you don't have. And it isn't just there are two or three there. Dozens and dozens of them. Are these people still alive for you? Very much so. Yeah. Absolutely. I'd know them if they walked in the room uh, immediately. And if you read a little bit about it, you would too. They're, they're, um, they're, we're sort of homogenized. You know, combination of dentistry and, uh, and orthodontists and cosmetic surgeons. Uh, the, 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 the story of our lives isn't written on us the way it was for them. Like the characters in Dickens, they're they're very quickly identifiable. Yeah, 
Is there an area, as we run out of time here, an area that you still want to cover? Is there somebody, something oh, sure. that really gets it? Sure, you? about 25 of them. Well, I'll have to live a very long time. I was going to say, how do, you, <laughs> how do you decide who you go to next? Something visceral, something just clicks. It's, um, uh, I, don't, I can't explain it. It's not rational. Some, you, you and I could have dinner, and you could make some comment, and I think that's it. And it's happened many times. Sometimes it's an editor who says something. Sometimes uh, it comes out of what I've previously written. This book, 1776, comes directly out of the Adams book and is a companion work, I feel, to the uh, John Adams book. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. Well, we wait, and we can't wait to see who it's going to be next. Thank you so much for sitting oh, down and talking you. with us. David Thank McCullough. you very much. Order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest. 